I keep getting everything half right. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Housekeepers Podcast. Dare I say the cleanest hour in podcasting. This, my friends, is going to be a fun show. We're already laughing before we even start. That's a good sign, right, Dave? Oh, oh yeah. <laughs> Today's guest is Dave Thompson, the director of Academy of Cleaning Excellence. He's a podcast host. He's an author, by the way. I have your I have the Kindle version of your oh, 1998 you. bestseller, uh, the new generation of cleaning. By the way, who is this on the cover? Is this your is this your kid grandkid? Who is this? That is my granddaughter, and nice. she, uh, yeah, she was she was a, a water baby from time she was born. Uh, you know, hey, been in the janitorial industry, you've got always a garage full of brightly colored tools <laughs> that one held water actually i got to tell you ralph i was we were out in the driveway and we heard this click 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 on the the driveway we turned around and looked here she is pushing it she gets into the mop bucket and she's got grandma's sun visor on and she pushes it up and i'm like i took a picture I'll tell you the whole story about that but <laughs> yeah and then and then to, to embarrass her just a little bit further we wrapped our uh, red Dodge Magnum with that book on it. So everywhere we drove around town, she was on the side of the car. <laughs> I love it. She's like uh, your version of Wendy, right? The, the Wendy's. Uh, I, well, you know, I never thought about it that way. I, uh, But yes, uh, your I Dave, guess that's true. She could be your Wendy. Uh, I, Why not? I think it's adorable. I love the whole idea of how much. I remember me as a kid, I was always grabbing all the, you know, tools out of my mother's you know closet brooms. I didn't actually use them to clean up. I was really more trying to defend myself or. <laughs> well, I'm not going to go there, Ralph. Let's not, let's not go down that I'm, path. I'm, I'm you and your mother's kid. closet. Yeah, I was, I was the youngest of four and, uh, and, uh, we, we would use those for swords, lightsabers. I mean, when Superman came out, forget it. I mean, we were, <laughs> you, you'd, you'd done been there. You had it all. We, we, uh, you know, we would, we would use the clothesline to try to fly and, you know, I, it just, the whole nine yards, we were just crazy. And when crazy we grew up, it's a little different than when they grow up now, right? I imagine so. I don't, I don't know. I, I, it's probably a different kind of fun, but we had legit fun when I was a kid. I mean, broken bones, skin, knees, you know, and we still live through it. <laughs> and we still lived through that. We did sure. all of this stuff. But because the thing is, we drew, we grew up in a generation of do. We did, we did, we did. That was all we knew. We didn't have all of these devices that didn't allow us to do. Uh, we didn't do as much mental brain power stuff as kids today. We did more physical. I'm not saying that's good or bad. It's just the differences yeah. in generations. Yeah, no question. I, I, I think I would, I think I would, you know, a lot of people are like, I would, you know, we, we had a better childhood. I don't know. I, I see kids around here have it pretty good. I mean, watching movies in the back of a car. Are you kidding me? I would have done anything to watch. You know, we used to do, we used to play, we used to play, um, uh, I spy with my little eye, which by the way, is the first time I ever learned about cheating because somebody could guess what you saw right away and you can't just, you can't give up your turn. So you immediately cheat. You're like, no, 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 it wasn't. That's not what I saw. That's not what I saw, Kathy. That's not what I saw. <laughs> so, so anyway, any, uh, anybody that's coming on to the podcast and listen today probably is wondering, what are these two old guys going to talk about the whole time? <laughs> Past history? <laughs> Housekeeper's podcast. I am, by the way, the housekeeper. It's my podcast. I get to talk whatever I want. <laughs> no, we're, we are, we're here to talk, talk about you and I, and I'm, very happy to have you on the show, and I'm very happy to learn all about you. Like we were saying before we got on the air, I mean, we're talking about five decades, not to give it away, but five decades, you know, not to give your age away, five decades. Hey, I'm of proud of it. I, I mean, you know, there's not there's nothing better than to be at this position and still be in the industry and be viable. And I think that's the the thing, you know, that, that we do here and I'm all about is I still have to be progressive. Um, if I'm not being progressive and forward, um, you don't need to talk to me. Yeah, I, I, no, I appreciate that. I, I, I too love the idea that we've got, you know, when you're talking to somebody who has 30, 40, 50 years in the cleaning industry, because like every industry, it's changed so much. 
fundamental problem we solve still exists, but how we solve that problem has just gone through so many different changes and metamorphosis and well, and the, still the, the same old problem. You know, Ralph, the speed of which we have to pivot uh, today is much different. We've always had to pivot to these things. However, as the world has understood with the pandemic that we're currently in, um, what is in another part of the world is here this evening, not next year, not three months from now. It's here this evening. Mm -hmm. And as people in the professional cleaning industry, we have to be able to pivot to every one of these crises because even though the pandemic of COVID is going on right now, it is not the only one that we've had to deal with. And, and as you said, somebody's been in five generations like this. I dealt with a number of different pandemics. Uh, while they weren't pandemic uh, in size and structure as far as the world was concerned, to that community where they were happening, they were. I, you know, I started my cleaning career in... 1986, so way after you. But my only reference, the only reason why I'm even given a, a, a date and time is because the A pandemic was kind of at its height. And I wasn't even working in healthcare. I work in healthcare now, but I wasn't working in healthcare at the time. And it was still, I mean, dominant. You know, I was working cleaning condos and then I was cleaning high schools and it's still out there, you know, the bloodborne pathogens, how to deal with blood spills, you know, uh, uh, needle sticks, that kind of thing. I, when I got into healthcare, I got into healthcare in the late 90s. When I got into healthcare, it was still a dominant, I could just imagine what it must have been like in nursing homes, in hospitals, when AIDS epidemic was at its peak. Like, you know, just talking about constantly going through these, these myriad of, of challenges and pandemics. And I mean, the AIDS epidemic was certainly a scary, scary time when it well, first came the, out. Nobody the, knew what it was. Well, you, you said 86. 86 mm -hmm. is when I got out of the service end of the cleaning industry. That's when I went from being a contractor in 86 as I went into sales. I moved from Tulsa, Oklahoma to St. Louis. And that was kind of the next step in my career is I'd had enough of owning my own business and dealing with all of the issues that, by the way, still contractors today still deal with. You and I talked about for God on the air. <laughs> it, it's still employment. It always has been. It never will be any different. We yeah. ebb and flow with that, and there's challenges and stuff, but that was still it. I got tired of all of that. I gave up the contract business and went into sales. And interesting, you mentioned what you did is because even though I was going into sales, I didn't have any sales training. I knew how to clean because I'd been a custodian since I was 14, cleaning classrooms and school buildings. You know, I'd been a cleaning contractor and done oh, all kinds of different buildings like contractors do. But when you go into sales of it, uh, it was basically, um, there's the street, there's the stuff. We've got the supplies, go sell and we'll deliver. <laughs> yeah, and that was your training. That was what you got. And, and so I went into sales basically because I knew how to make a product work. And still today, the reason I do what I do is I know how and I know why we need to do what we're doing. And I think that is probably the best thing that I ever did was I actually learned that part of it before I went into sales because then I could actually help the customer get the results because they didn't, they didn't care what supply they bought. I mean, really, come on. Nobody really cares yeah. what supply they bought. As long as they get the result they after, they're, they're after. But most people don't really understand why they're needing what they're needing and actually how to get what they're getting to get the result. And so 35 and years honestly, later. And quite honestly, we don't care. We don't care. I remember. Well, to, I remember to, the, I, to the biggest extent, you're correct. I, I remember uh, listening to somebody recently. They were talking about how a, a nursing home administrator is demanding that they add staff in laundry. And, you know, they're like, well, we have to, so we have to add staff because the administrator is demanding that we add staff in laundry. And I said, the administrator doesn't want to have more staff in laundry. Oh, that's what she's saying. You should listen to her. You have to no. read between the lines. No. The administrator doesn't want laundry issues. 
her only and, answer and, and, is you must need more staff. Right. And, and so the easiest thing is to throw more staff at it. And, yeah, but she's, and not, she's not out there. Yeah. She's not out there just trying to get more staff. She's like, I, the laundry's not working. All right. I just want more. I want my laundry to work. Yeah, yeah, that that's it. And I think that was the, the thing that I learned earlier in, in the sales career. And so, you know, as the years went on selling product and supplies and, and, and results, it, it then pivoted over to why were we really doing what we're doing? Uh, you know, yeah. I always ask this. Do, do, do you know what the single one word that a three-year-old to four-year-old child ask? The why? single one word. Why? Correct. Because at why? that point in our life, what we're doing is we don't understand. We don't know. So we're asking why so that we can understand. Somewhere along the way, we decide that we know exactly all the whys. We don't need to ask that question anymore. And so that's what I decided to do is I decided to go in and start working with the 400 clients that I had and say, why are you buying the supplies you're buying? Why do you need this? Why is that not working? Because, you know, year after year, day after day, we're selling basically the same stuff to them. Yeah, yeah, it's a different manufacturer, different little color, it's little, but it's all the same stuff. And I started asking, why am I doing what I'm doing? And when you actually start doing that, you start finding out that there's possibly, and quite often, a different, maybe better way. But if you don't ask the question, you never explore the reason, and I go back to the same thing. Why were they buying what they're buying was to get a result. When I started asking the question of why every single freaking time, by the way, everybody got tired of that and they still do because <laughs> I asked the same thing. They want an answer. Well, I can't give you an answer to you answer the whys, but then the why answer becomes really the correct answer because once I, somebody understands why they're doing it, then they answer the question themselves. What I do is simply direct them, guide them to the solution that they're going to come to. And that's what's so much fun about what I'm doing. You said 50 years. Why am I still in this 50 years later? Because I've now pivoted over to completely full education using the Y formula as my basis, which is still what I started doing 40 years ago. That is a perfect backdrop to go to the beginning. So right now you're in Florida, but you've mentioned St. Louis. You've mentioned Oklahoma. Where, where did you grow up? Where, where were you born? Where did you grow up? Where did you spend the, the childhood years? Well, it's interesting you ask that question. You see this map right here behind me? Yes, sir. Every student that comes into my classroom here, by the end of the class, is asked to take a pen from right here and put it in the map of where they were born. Oh. Do you need to consult the map? Or can you just tell me where you were born? <laughs> you know, what's interesting, though, is what we do is we you know, under, understand. I kind of pass some things up, right? <laughs> uh, uh, what, we, what we do is we, we judge people by what we see. You know, the personal physical appearance by the language, the, the dialect that they have. And one of the interesting things, you mentioned Florida. I am in Florida, Orlando, Florida now. Not where I would have chosen to, you know, work into my final days of my career. Really? However, no, no, it wouldn't be. But the thing here is, is I knew that it was going to be multicultural. Here's the thing. I had no idea what I was getting ready to step into as far as that, uh, that avenue. And it has been such and still is wonderful because it stretches my my world view because of the students that come in here. Um, I just got, had a guy go through a certification class the other day from, and he, he, he put on the map Haiti. And, you know, when you start talking with them and the stories and he's an entrepreneur, he's out there polishing terrazzo floors, marble floors, granite. He comes to a full class. He pays the money. He gets the education and, and, and that's what's so much fun. Florida isn't where I would have chosen, 
because my pin on the map is Montgomery, Alabama. Ah, so you kind of grew up right here in the southern. Now, I didn't say grew right? up. You said where oh. was I born? All right. Where? What are you doing to me, Dave? Where did you grow up? <laughs> I grew. I, I. I. You know. Hey, I was in uh, thirteen schools in one school year in my second grade. Oh yeah. What did your dad do? What did your mom do? What was? Why did you guys move around so much? Uh, well, time? let's not go into all the details, but let's just say he couldn't keep a job. Okay. So, you so you know, everybody said, you know, everybody says military. No, military doesn't move you that much. But the wow. thing here is, is it's it's made me aware that it's not where you are; it's what you do with where you are. And 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 I think over my career, that's been the fun thing about the cleaning industry, is there's not a building on the planet that doesn't need us, in some Did way, you? shape, or form. Did you work as a kid? Like, did you have like part-time jobs? Did you mow lawns, anything like that when you were a kid? I started cleaning in the uh, consolidated high school where I started junior high. Back then, they called it junior high, folks. I'm just telling you, I, you'll have to look that up, junior high. What grade were today. you in? What grade? Because I, I did too, but in between Freshman. my eighth and ninth grade. Yeah, okay. Eighth grade. So me too. Yeah, me 14. too. 14. Yep, me too. The, the, the school custod or the school superintendent, now I said it's consolidated school in uh, northeastern Colorado, came in and said the um, custodian has come into an accident, has broken both legs. He's got this big roll of keys, and he tells me you can unlock the doors. You know where they go and what the tools are. I got to tell you, Ralph, still today, I have no idea why I know that. <laughs> <laughs> but the first thing I did was, okay, yeah, let's talk about it. And he said, I'll get you a study hall. I said, try again. He says, I'll get you a passing grade in Spanish. I grabbed the keys. I've been mopping floors ever since. <laughs> Anything to get a passing grade in Spanish. And you know what the fun part of that all is? My wife is half Mexican. I'm the token gringo at family reunions. I understand nothing. But the thing is, is that's the way I started my career in the cleaning industry at 14. Now, yes, I mean, you know, I've done other things um, in the, uh, no, I guess it would be the late 70s. I decided that I was working, um, gosh, part-time or full-time at an equipment rental facility. I was the manager of equipment rental for construction stuff. And my dad was an, um, on the city council in the local small town uh, north of Tulsa, Oklahoma. And the cleaning contract came up for the city, city buildings. Oh. He said, well, don't you think you should do that? I go, yeah. I mowed yards, you know, when I was a kid. Yeah. I mean, you know, there's a whole story behind that. I ain't going to go into that one. But um, I decided to start doing that at night. And after a year, I was making more money at night than I was working full time, you know, at the rental place. Well, they pulled a few tricks and I decided to quit that. And I already had my business started, you know, I was doing that. So I added some other accounts and a guy came to me and said, hey, uh, I've got this uh, cleaning business and I need somebody to eventually take it over. I said, sure, fine. What do we do? He goes, well, do you need to come out with me one night and, and learn? Now, I've got to tell you, folks, this was during the days of the Rocky Horror Picture Show. At the height of it. And this gentleman had four movie theaters that he took care of. And he said, I need somebody to supervise and make sure these movie theaters get done. So I went out there and I, I, I watched them and everything. And, and the first night afterwards, after we did the tour, I'll never forget it. Cause he, he said, so what do you think? I said, well, there's two people I'd fire right away. He was like, wait a minute. He hadn't even took the job yet. I said, well, Hey, I don't, I don't deal with drugs and those guys are smoking and I'm not going to deal with it. He said, well then fire them, but you got to still get the work done. I took when the you, job. And, I took the job and fired them, and <laughs> it 
<laughs> yeah. So, hey, when you start talking about employees and issues, my first professional job where it wasn't just me, I wound up firing somebody on the first night. Yeah, I, I, um, I can't even, I can't even count the amount of times I've, I've caught people uh, drinking on the job, uh, less than, less than, um, you know, less than uh, uh, able to perform their job duties. Uh, it's been always been a challenge. But when you, when you were, when you first started cleaning, so when you first started cleaning your the school, were you alone? You were the only person who was cleaning. Because when my school, we had like an entire crew because it was a lot of work. There was a lot of classrooms. Oh, well, yeah, I understand. This was a small, uh, consolidated school. Um, I think the graduating class. I never did graduate there. I graduated in uh, Oklahoma, but uh, I think the graduating class was like 22. Hmm, very small. You know, so yeah, I mean, you know, there was, there was two buildings, you know, on, you know, on the property. Uh, yeah. I, I still remember cause I took my wife back. Oh gosh, this has been probably 2006 or oh. something. I took her back to the building cause she didn't believe the stories I said, I told. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, there were, there was all the, the things and, and, uh, of course, the coal chute where we had to shovel coal to fire the furnace, which was part of the custodian's job, right? Um, you know, it was the chute was still there, but the coal furnace was gone. Um, yeah, I'll never forget her face whenever I walked in, uh, walked in to the auditorium, gymnasium auditorium at that, you know, thought they were wood bleachers. Walked under the bleachers, grabbed the light, grabbed the dust mop, and, and walked out. She was like, "Just," she, I, I said, "Here, all these years are still in the same place." Still in the same. Well, once you find a good place to put your equipment, that's where it goes. It's usually under a stairwell somewhere, anyway. <laughs> bleacher well, stairwell. I, yeah, and, and she said, "There's no way that you could have done that without somebody being there to teach you to." You know, so all of those stories had to be true. I said, "Yeah, it was. Well, it's been my life. I I embrace the fact." that I've been a custodian all my life. Uh, did I choose it? I guess I did because I accepted, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, so yes, I chose it, but it has been a wonderful career. I mean, and look at me. Now I educate students from all over the world, literally from all over the world. I, I had a gentleman from South Africa uh, come here. Uh, to be in class with me for a week. And, and I mean, you know, those, those are experiences that you just can't measure. Yeah, it's pretty great. So when you, when you were clean, we, so your, your dad helps you get the cleaning contract for the, for the city, right? Well, he didn't help. He just said it's available. And that was all right. he did. That I, was I, my apologize. dad's style. That was my dad's yeah. style because I got to tell you, the, the way I start my my very first job, you ask, it was lawn mowing. Dad bought the lawn mower, put it in the back of the deuce in the quarter, got his coffee cup and his newspaper out, set at the end of the street, started reading the paper. And I said, so wh where am I going to go mow? He says, I don't know. There's 40 houses that way and there's 40 houses over there. I'm sure that by the end of the day, you'll make some money somewhere. And, and literally that was, that was the way dad did because that was, you know, he was in sales for general electric and you no, know, nobody gave him the career. You had to find it. He said, here's your opportunity. So yeah, the cleaning contract was there. Yeah. And, you know, I think that, I think that's the thing about this. I, why is it that we all believe we're entitled to something uh, most of us that's been in this for decades, like myself and other people I know, you know, we don't wait for somebody to tell us we can do it. You didn't. No, certainly not. I knew I knew what I wanted to do. And I was like, there's got to be somebody who's interested in learning what I know because I'm an <laughs> educator. You know, I like to teach. And, uh, that's how it happened. I'm like, I'm gonna, I will knock on every door until I find somebody go, yeah, I am interested in learning how to sell to commercial cleaning services to healthcare. You know, that's what I do. So but the reason I even brought it up is because I'm trying to find out what, I, what I'd love to know is 
did you said did you get you got the contract was it again one of those small accounts so you were just doing the cleaning yourself so you were kind of running the business and operating the business at the same time when did you start having employees or was it when that guy came and said hey i'm looking for somebody i have a cleaning company i need somebody was that the first time we actually started to work with other people well i think that's you know every small contractor in the cleaning business usually starts with him or her and their spouse of course or a family member and i did the same thing yep yep right i did the same thing um that didn't work now most generally spousal uh job situations in this industry just doesn't work there's too much together time and somebody has to take and be the one that has to to brunt the the solutions the end um whenever i started cleaning the theaters with the gentleman uh he came to me and said well i want to get out of this business so i'll set up a deal with you every year that you work part of your pay is one quarter of the business by the end of four years you should own the business Holy moly, 25%? That's great. What he didn't tell me oh, here was all the other contracts. <laughs> okay. And, you know, this was one of those things in your youth and your enthusiasm, and I can do anything I want to do. We did. Well, he, he came up one day and said, well, I'm selling the business. Uh, What? How long, how long have you been working for him when, when this happened? I was right at three years. Oh, so you basically own three quarters of the business. Well, here, here was a lesson that I learned the hard way. It, did, it didn't work out, did it? It wasn't, un, it wasn't in writing. Mm-hmm. Unfortunately, I've learned the hard way, even if it is writing. There are some dishonest people out there. Well, all of that being said... What we were do, what we wound up doing is I, I, um, I traded my house for the business. Probably mistake number two. But I wasn't about to let what I had put three years of everything into. How many how many contracts did you have at this point? What was your focus? Well, at that time, we were still doing a lot of general cleaning, but we also did a major amount of floor care for the Walmart store chain in Oklahoma. And so what I did is I traded my house for the business, moved into an apartment. I had zero money and a payroll to make in one week. Well... By 86, we had moved from the probably 10 uh, Walmart stores to 50. We had moved uh, out of the general cleaning and went strictly into floor care. At that time, in Tulsa, there was a Skaggs Alpha Beta. We had all of those 24-hour grocery stores. Mm -hmm. Uh, So, you know, working 24-hour grocery stores... Then having the floor care teams, we had four different trucks that went out every night to different Walmarts all over Oklahoma. Um, you know, yeah, there's all kinds of stories I could tell you about all of that. But by 86... I got to tell you, Walmarts generally have some of the greatest floor care ever. I mean, they really look great. Yeah, yeah you know, I, I there was a good and bad stuff from Walmart. Um yeah, I met Sam Walton several times, actually in the store, you know, came and thanked us for our work and everything. I'll never forget the one day he came in and he needed a, a, a fishing license and he actually had to borrow money from one of the clerks so they could buy the fishing license because uh, he had forgot it in his bib overalls. I mean, literally, if you didn't know Sam Walton, you would have never, never recognized him because, you know, he was just a regular old Joe whenever he came around the buildings in that time. Um, but you know, it taught me a lot about contracts, about how to bid them, what to look for. 
And still today, when I do my job bidding class, I revert back to some of the things I did in the, in the 80s because they still are viable. Yeah, absolutely. And, and you know, what's, what's interesting is I've I've spent the bulk of my cleaning career in healthcare, and we we uh, hospitals may be a little different, but senior care, certainly nursing homes, we bid based on the number of residents or the number of rooms, not square footage, which is completely different than what you would do in a commercial cleaning. Typical, typically, it's all based on square footage. Well, you know, so I've had the experience with school buildings. I had the experience with general cleaning of all kinds of facilities from manufacturing to printing uh, places to class A office buildings um, to, you know, in Tulsa, we had movie oil theaters. and we had airlines, movie theaters. Yes. <laughs> so I got all of that experience and then I went strictly into floor care. And I really liked floor care because I could, I could standardize what I'm doing. I could specialize in what I was doing. Um, and, you know, 80% of what we do is taking care of a floor, even no matter where you're at. 80% of what we spend our time and money and effort on is, is the floor. So I learned that, um, like I said, in 86, I got out of it, moved from Tulsa to St. Louis, went into sales. And that's where I moved my next step in my career was take the knowledge, take the understanding, take what I'd learned, the practical experience and the hard knocks, and then translate that over to how can I help all of these other customers? And that became more education because it was more K through 12 universities, parochial schools, and then you would mix some other customers along with it. But they became my testing grounds for what ultimately I do today. So but in, in 1986, there seems to be like this big, you, you're going to sell the business and you're going to go into sales. Does that mean you went to work for somebody else and started what, selling chemicals? Is that cleaning supplies, chemicals, equipment, that kind of thing? Yeah, I walked into St. Louis. I had never been to St. Louis in my life. Um I had a next door neighbor that had moved from uh, Tulsa to uh, south of St. Louis with uh, AT&T or no, well, I'm sorry, Southwestern Bell at the time. And he says, I'll give you a room and board for a month, but then that's, that's it. And I said, okay, I'll take it. Uh, my wife, had, we'd, we'd moved, uh, I'd moved my wife in with my parents, uh, left everything, drove my little Mazda B2000 pickup to St. Louis and started just looking for a job and it was kind of interesting because i'm i'm not a conventional person i just don't do anything that everybody else does i don't do it the same way uh, i don't know it's I guess the way i'm wired me and too. i it served me well apparently all these years right <laughs> but you know the thing is is i i was like okay how do i actually go to look for a job to move my career and to move forward what i've got I can't just leave it. I can't do something else. So I went to janitorial supply houses and posed as a new business owner, moving to St. Louis, starting his own cleaning company. All right. That's I had nice no move. intention of doing that, by the way. <laughs> yeah, that's a nice so yes, folks. Yes, I guess. Technically, I lied. Okay. So just going to get that out there. But the thing that what I was doing is I was interviewing janitorial supply houses was my was my reason for doing it, because basically I wanted to see who was going to treat me like I wanted to treat other people. That's a nice little it's almost like a secret shopper kind of thing. It, it, well, it was. And, and I learned yeah. this from the from the supermarket industry when I was cleaning floors. They had secret shoppers. They came in at night, they inspected things, they came in during the day, and that's how their competition knew about what somebody else was doing. So that's exactly what I did. And my, my reason was to find somebody that would allow me to work with clients and do the things that I knew best, and that was how to deal with people. Luckily, I fell into the right one and had no idea when I took the job that I had walked into the Wallace racing family. Oh, 
they owned a cleaning supply store as well. Well, the Wallace Racing family, actually, the whole family history is around the cleaning industry. No, Believe it or I not. I have no idea. Uh, most people don't. So that's why right over here, I've got a, a big uh, slick and a, and a tire uh, and uh, a poster from Rusty Wallace. Uh, that's a whole nother thing. But I knew the, the you know, uh, yeah, so, I mean, yeah, when you start looking at history of people in the cleaning industry, uh, the, yeah, yeah, there's a lot of it. But anyway, you know, I went in and you said, what did I get? Well, okay, so I started, and for the first year, I worked inside sales, which means I worked sales in the store because I wanted to learn what other people were doing, good, bad, and, and everything, and then how to adjust that to what I knew. And then based on that, then I started looking at what the salespeople outside were doing. And then I set my goals as to what I wanted to do and didn't look back. It's pretty great. And, and I, when did you start doing outside sales? When did, when did you go, all right, now I'm going to start actually meeting with, and you know, what's fun. What's interesting. It just as I, as if I could just unpack this a little bit. Okay. <laughs> you talked about it. You talked about it before, and and I just want to say I, I I concur that there's a a lot of people who come into the cleaning industry with a great amount of sales knowledge information and very uh -huh. little operational side information. <laughs> and I find that my superpower is I spent so many years in the operations. And know nothing about sales, right? Like that's how I got into sales because I knew so much about the operations. They're like, well, just we just come and explain it because you you can explain it better than everyone else can. And it's it's in that explanation that the sale is made. I didn't know that at the time, but it seems like that's kind of how the outside sales. When you moved into the outside sales, I bet you found the same thing, right? Well, it, it was very obvious. All I did was went out and showed people how to get a result. I, that's what they were purchasing. They were, I mean, the tools of the trade are what are the, the, you know, the things it's kind of like my courses right now. The course is just the tools like would be, uh, it, you know, if you can uh, toilet paper or, or hand towels. Okay. But the, what they wanted is they want dry hands. They want it healthy. Okay. So, when I learned that, which, as you said, it takes you a little while to pivot that in your brain, right? Mm -hmm. um, it didn't take me long. So the first company I worked with was OK Vacuum Janitor Supply there uh, with, like I said, the Wallace family. And whenever that business went out of business uh, after ownership passed on and everything, um, I moved to another company in the same uh, – in, in – in uh, St. Louis. And my goal was to be number one in sales. And I achieved that by the second year and never gave it up. And how did you, how did you achieve number one status? What'd you do? What, what made you so different or successful? Well, I think there was a, there was a couple of things, Ralph. And I think that's just what everybody has to realize. You have to find out where you belong. I did not belong in Metro St. Uh, St. Louis. My, my history where I'm comfortable is rural America. And so what did I do? I moved to Rolla, Missouri, which is about a hundred miles West of St. Louis. And, you know, a gentleman early in my career, I probably believe by that time I was in my mid thirties. Um, he said, I have some advice for you. Find out what everybody is doing and do not do it. He was very, very specific in the words that he chose. And I still tell people the same thing today. That's what I've always done. I didn't want to fight everybody else in Metro St. Louis, all of the other suppliers, all the other salespeople go out to where nobody was going. So what was happening? Uh, everybody from Kansas City would come out into rural Missouri. Everybody from St. Louis would come to rural Missouri uh, and they'd cherry pick different accounts and then go home and then come back. And so what did I do? I just moved to where that was and made a nucleus there. And then I worked out from that. And then I took on some of the big players, you know, in the industry and said, well, you know, you got to have a challenge. 
can you beat them at their own game? And this is this is when green cleaning, you know, uh, I, I don't know if you remember when green cleaning started being the thing. Of course I do. It's it's uh, it reared its head quite quickly. And what's interesting about green cleaning is even today, and this is good lord, twenty years later more than that 30 years later since green cleaning really sprung its head so 30 years later there still isn't any hospital grade clean green cleaning chemicals there's nothing that can be claimed that can claim disinfectant you know as a as a, a kill ratio for for bacteria the only thing that we use in healthcare that's green is like window cleaner or maybe deodorizer <laughs> well, I'm not. I'm not going to get into all of that today on this one here. Okay. I mean, you know, yeah, yeah. I know it's the cleanest hour on podcasting, but we, you. Uh, let, let's uh, <laughs> let's let's stay away from uh, exactly all that. But I, I mean, the thing about it is, is I was actually doing things with these clients that was healthy, which is the part of green clean that I like is the healthy aspect. Okay. Um, I'm not, not, I don't pinpoint a pr product or anything. It's yeah. whether the outcome is healthy, no matter yeah. how you get there. So, you know, the thing was, is we were doing healthy cleaning before it had a name. Along came a name. We attached that to it. And, and that's when I took a major school district in, in uh, uh, Columbia, Missouri. And I said, what can I do with it? And that was my next pivot in my career was when I decided that I had lost one of my big accounts uh, due to, you know, the superintendent came in, said, you're out, you're in. And, you know, sometimes they're the good old boy things. There's nothing you're going to do about it. Don't fight it. But it, it, what it did, Ralph, is it freed me up to go, okay, so what am I going to do with this next step in my career? And that was to look at myself, look at what I was doing and say, what's the next advance? And that was, I wanted to get out of selling product and supplies. Um, you know, I'm in my mid fifties by this point, uh, early fifties. And I said, what am I going to do with the rest of my life and the rest of this career? I've worked so hard to get to this point. What am I going to do with it? I can't continue. I mean, I could, I just didn't want to be still, you know, toting an oat book at 75 down the street, trying to get somebody to buy toilet paper. So I said, what can we do with this healthy cleaning? And I took the Columbia school district and I said, let's go about this even a little differently. And for the first month, I never showed them a product. I never talked about a product. I never, and it wasn't because they didn't want to. But what I did is I went in and learned everything I could about them and went into this whole mental thing for me as to why am I doing what I'm doing and basically interviewed and asked questions until everybody was about sick of me and wanted to run me out. <laughs> and then that's when we all started going together. When I left there uh, six years ago, Columbia Public Schools have has won two national green cleaning awards. And I believe Mike Jones still today is now working with ISSA green cleaning. He's part of the green schools initiative and he is a green cleaning guru. You know, the thing about it is what's so satisfying about all that, Ralph, I didn't do it. I just guided them where they needed to go and help them realize a vision that they had had. I'll never forget this, the, the manager of the department that left. He had been there for 35 years. He retired and we were having a, a lunch, you know, what, you know, the retirement lunch. And I said, how many times have you been in front of the school board? You've had a long illustrious career with the school board. How many times have you been in front of the school board? I said twice. <laughs> <laughs> Not a lot. He says, and both times you were standing right there behind me, pushing me to do what I did. I would have never <laughs> been in front of the school board if it hadn't been for you. And I think that's the whole thing. He wasn't there for the wrong reason. He was there for the right reason. He was there to promote the healthy things that the school district was doing. And 
I would say I haven't been there for a while, but at, whenever I was there, every time that they went for a budget meeting, his budget did not get cut. You know, I've heard this on my career. Well, they're going to cut the budget, cut the budget. That's because you haven't established your value. And when we got through, or when I got through and I've left, he still doesn't get questioned about his budget because they know every single thing is itemized. They don't cut his budget. They add school buildings. They add what he needs. Uh, that I, that I'm not trying to say he gets everything he needs, but he itemizes everything and utilizes it 100%. And I think that's what keeps me driving forward is stories like that. That's pretty great. I, I, you know, there's a quote in your book you write, um, and it's just kind of going along as I, as you're talking, I'm just thinking about it. It says, uh, to say that a building is clean does not mean it is healthy, but if a building is healthy then it is clean and Correct. that whole mantra, that whole idea, if you take healthy first, clean is inevitable. Well, and I think the pandemic has, you know, I had one of my students, uh, an international student, by the way, that made a comment to me and it was very pointed. He says, you know, we got millions of infection prevention experts now. <laughs> and, you know, I had to stop and think about that for a moment. You know, what, you, what is he trying? And it was like, right, everybody feels they're an infection prevention expert because all they've got to do is do something that just magically has this, this, this magic dust, you know, that we can just <laughs> spray out all over everything and everything is great again. We can wear a mask or we can get a vaccine or we can do this. And, and I'm like, okay, the one thing that the pandemic has done for the cleaning industry as a complete industry is made an awareness to the fact that it isn't about what we see. You don't see this virus. You don't see AIDS. You don't see MRSA until it's already there. You see That's the right. results, the after effects, what it does to you, but you don't yeah. see the infections. You know, uh, that when I wrote that book, the reason that I wrote it, the new generation of cleaning and put her on the front page is because that's the generation's health that we're here to protect. My health is ruined. Okay. I mean, I got COPD from the cleaning industry when I was 20. Oh, wow. I've had COPD and dealt with asthma, chronic asthma for better than 35, 40 years. You don't get rid of it. You, all you do is pay money to, to mitigate it. Mm -hmm. So my, my the cleaning industry ruined my health. What I'm here to do is to protect that new generation that's coming up. That's her generation. That's the people that, that come to class and learn. So the reason I wrote that in there is to get people to understand that what we do is not about what you perceive. What we do is to protect you because we are in a war every single day in every single building against an infection that you can't see. And it isn't only one virus. It isn't only one bacteria. We fight that war every day. I, I tell people in class all the time, we're not cleaners. I wish we could get rid of the moniker cleaning industry. You know what we really are? No, tell me. We're risk maintenance professionals. We manage risk to keep people safe. You know, there's, there's, and I, it, it's, it's probably been since the inception of, of the cleaning industry, whenever that, that started, but there, there seems to be everywhere I look, there's always that push to change the name <laughs> Like I know that, you know, this is called the housekeepers podcast and I can't tell you how many people are just like, well, I don't work in housekeeping. And I'm like, all right, you're, I'm the housekeeper. I, I'm not afraid of the name. <laughs> like, let's just keep going here. I mean, people in the cleaning industry. And then, you know, then of course you get that same thing where, Hey, I'm not in the clean. Hey. hey. Aha, we have a voice. We have we, somebody we, else on the line, folks. Wait a minute. We, we, we're we're going to hear from somebody else. They've got something to we say. Hey. 
Stop it. Well, you know what? Yeah, hey, I, I, that remind, you know, I've got a door that's open right here, and, and Jim Supply is where we're housed at, by the way. And, you know, they allow me to run the academy and, and everything. But the, the storefront's right out there, and every once in a while, people look through the doors and they'll just walk right in. And I've been Certainly, on a podcast, they the they'll walk around, and I'm like, can I help you? <laughs> oh, you're you're in the middle of something? Oh, yeah. Well, yeah. Hey, come on, sit down. Let's, let's talk, you know. I have, a, but that's I, have life. A lazy, I have a lazy dog. He's literally laying in his bed, head on the floor, barking at who knows what. Like, why don't you just go up and see what it is? <laughs> <laughs> you know, I think the thing about it is, though, is, you know, I, have you heard of my, my, my program, my motivational program? I have. Well, I know that you're, you're doing the, um, Oh, what is it called? The the Rockstar Custodian program. Is that what you're talking about? Correct. Where, so where... I, 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 I ask people all of the time, what does custodian mean? I mean, these are the these are the custodians I'm asking this, not people outside of our industry. I'm asking people in our industry, what does custodian mean? And what do they say? What, what does it mean? They have no idea. They start going into what we do. I said, not what we do. What does it mean? In other words, you know, I'm going back to my why thing, you know, of course. Yeah. But look up the word custodian. What does it actually mean? So I start that presentation by putting on the screen the dictionary's definition of custodian. There's nothing wrong. Matter of fact, it's it's of great value. And I'm not going to tell you folks what it means. You got to look it up yourself. Yeah. So the, <laughs> the, 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 the thing here is the word custodian, the word janitor, do not have the same meaning as to what society has burdened us with. And I think that's what our industry needs to do. Don't change the name, take ownership of the name, embrace it and prove there's value to it. And that's what the rockstar program does. Isn't uh gender, the, the word Janice is the, the goddess of the keys or something. And so janitor is about the person with keys and custodian is the person who cares for, in charge of. Okay, so so you told everybody now they got to find out whether you're right or wrong. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm right. You can look, Google it. <laughs> you you, you said I'm supposed to have a laugh, but I want to have it at your expense, not mine. <laughs> but I mean, no. this is a this is a is the truth. We use words all the time, and we don't really know what we're saying, and. I'm not going to say on air who it was, but I was I was working uh, I was actually in Washington D.C. at a green cleaning meeting, and uh, some people were using some words, and I took exception to them. And somebody said, "You're being semantical about the about this." And I said, "Yeah." And then I just simply looked at him and said, "If words don't matter, then shut the up." Oh. All right. And I, and I do that all the time. And I said, see, I didn't put a word in there. You put the word in that. there. I, I didn't want to. And I'm happy that you paused and didn't. Uh, how's, this is the cleanest hour in podcasting. And no it still day. is. And it still is. <laughs> but the thing about it is, is what your statement, the, the, what I wrote. If a building yeah. is healthy, it is clean. Words matter. Put them in order. If it is healthy, it's going to be clean. Yeah, but just because you say it's clean by the what you see does not mean that it is healthy. So it goes back to why are we in the industry we're in? Whether you're in healthcare industry, whether you're cleaning uh, whatever building, whatever facility is on the planet, no matter where it is, we mitigate risks so that people can stay safe and healthy. Yeah, I think it's I think it's a valid point. I think that I too agree that words matter and and. Um... What's the word I can use to stop him from talking? Hey, hey. <laughs> shut up. Does it apparently work? <laughs> nah, he, he's, he's, he doesn't, you know, I fear he's sleeping. I think he's just dreaming of something he should be barking at, which I don't know, but that just makes me smile. He's dreaming of something to bark at. He's dreaming of problems that he can get mad at. That's basically what he <laughs> said. Oh, my, my. Oh, dogs. No, I think I think it's I think it's absolutely right. I think that I think that there should be, and you know, like when I, I use the example of 
somebody recently said that the ad administrator wants to add hours to laundry. And I just corrected them. They don't want to add <clears throat> hours to laundry. They want no laundry issues. And they're just trying to figure out how to best do it. And right. I think it's the same thing with the word housekeeper. I think it's the same thing with the word janitor, custodian, cleaner. There is a negative connotation that comes along with that title. And so nobody cares. If, if it didn't have a negative connotation, nobody would care if I say, hey, um, we're all the housekeepers come over here. Nobody would be like, we're not housekeepers. We're this or we're that. You wouldn't have that if there wasn't a negative connotation with it, right? So that's, that's all it is. People just don't want to have the, the, you know, the, the baggage that goes with the title. And so that's why everybody was so interested in trying to figure out a new term. Well, but I'm, I, I'm know, afraid it, it, that if you brought up a new term, it would just simply have the same connotation. It would be it would be bastardized at some point because exactly. that's what society does with everything, right? Exactly. Uh, I would say this has probably been about four years ago after I moved here to Orlando. And uh, I work with Daryl Hicks. I'm sure you know him. I think he's either scheduled to be on one of your podcasts or already has. No, he's been remember. on. He's been on. Yeah. Yeah. Daryl Hicks and I have worked together for a lot of years. He co-authors our infection prevention courses here at the Academy. I have his book right here. Infection Correct. Prevention for me. Thank you very much. Um, Daryl and I have worked together at, at different shows and we had gotten invited to do our, my wow presentation, uh, how to get to wow at the uh, AHE conference that was being held here in Orlando. And I submitted my, my paper uh, to them and everything. And they liked everything, but they said, you cannot use the word janitor. <laughs> and Daryl looked at me and said, well, what are you going to do? You, well, I guess we're not going to go. Because that's the key. I mean, everything in there revolves around that word. And I said, OK. I said, they're not going to eliminate me from coming and speaking. But this goes back to the healthcare industry that you're a part of, right? They do not like the word janitor. And what I didn't know at the time was the keynote speaking of that conference was that we're not janitors. Oh. Of course, I didn't know that, right? Right. But what I did is I changed the word. We did the wow presentation, getting to wow. Um, and at the end of the session, I said, everybody that is, um, uh, has been here today, I appreciate it. And they were asking, where's my card? And I said, I didn't give you a card because I can't use the word during the presentation. <laughs> presentation is over. I will stand at the door and I will hand you my business card. So I stood at the door and I had a whole stack of them. I was handing out business cards and I'd see people go out into the concourse a little ways and several people made a loop and came back. And pretty soon about half of the people that had been in the meeting were standing outside waiting to talk to me. And I had told Daryl, I said, Daryl, watch what's going to happen. They came back and they had some conversation that they wanted to talk about the words that I had used on my business card. And I said, well, I guess my statement got the reaction I wanted. Oh, no, we, 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 we have a problem with this and everything. I said, see, what you're assuming is that I needed a positive reaction from you. Huh. What I needed was a reaction from you to come and ask me something, because now we can have a conversation. And I think this is the thing is with words. If we don't use words correctly, if we don't, and this is knowledge, right? This isn't the word. It's my mom always said, it's not how you say it. It's not what you say. It's how you say it. And I think this is the connotation of janitor, housekeeper, custodian, whatever word that you want to use is how we perceive that. And unfortunately, in our industry, we've perceived things by what the public wants to let us. And so that's how come we are devalued. Yeah, I think it also starts with the base pay. And so you make the least amount 
by being a housekeeper or a janitor or a cleaner. <clears throat> and so if we paid cleaning professionals more, there would be more of a draw. It'd be more attractive and we would lose the negative connotation. That's the message of the Housekeeper Podcast. Raise the rates. More <laughs> money for cleaners. That's what well, you know what? <laughs> you know, I've been told all my life that I can't make the money that I say. But yet, <clears throat> you know, here I am. You know, when they told me that I couldn't make a living selling education because the industry gave it away, I said, it's the most valuable resource that I have. I do not give it away. Uh, you have to pay for it. And I think what's interesting now is people come to my classes. I get paid before I do my work. I always offer a 100% money back guarantee. I have never refunded anybody's educational money yet. No, that speaks that speaks volumes. And I like I like where you're going with this. I like that you're holding your ground because I too, and I know a lot of people. Uh, I'm uh, you know I'm with I'm in the the National Speakers Association, and you know so we're presenters. A lot of us are education you know educational people. We're presenters. We're motivational speakers. When we do it for a living, and there are so many people willing to give away free content that it can sometimes be like, why are you in this business? But everybody's giving it away for free. And the truth is with peace and love, if you're getting it from for, for free, you're generally not getting it from me or you, it sounds. And because I get paid for it, as I imagine, because you get paid for it, we work extra hard to earn the money. We, we go out of our way to be really, really great, really thought provoking, really on the forefront. Right. And, um, Oh yeah, the count, the countless hours that we do in the background to produce viable, progressive, up to date, relative education is sometimes astounding. My wife says, "What are you on the computer again?" I'm researching. I'm constantly researching, and I think that's the interesting part. You know, uh, you said age. I have no problem with it. I'm 64 just this month. And September 11th, happy birthday, by the way. I, um, thank you very much. I um, missed it, but being September 11th, I was like, I didn't know. Should I reach out? Should I not? Should I? Hey, I'm sorry. This is your day, but happy hey, birthday. It, it, it's, been, it's been my birthday long before 9 11 happened. There you go. There you go. <laughs> and, and, you know, and, and I have to say, Ralph, I know we're gr gr getting close to the end of our time. Up, yeah. You know, but, you know, as a heart surgery survivor now, I, I, I look at things a tad bit differently. Uh, yes, I do have a second lease on life, but I'm happy with where my career is because I've been able to move it forward, but with still the same passion, with still the same uh, uh, bravado of making sure that people get results. And I want to make sure that the education that I provide is valued. I could probably charge more, but I would rather have them afterwards say that was worth more than I paid. Um, and, and that's, that's always what I want to hear. I want people to come back. I want people to, to help us move the bar forward. I've got a phrase I want to use at the end, but I, and I'm going to hold it back for just a more moment, but you know, yeah, I've got full of all of those little quips and I did write a few of them in the book. Yeah, that's that's it though. If you have anything else to add, I would love to hear it. We are running a little bit past where we want to be. So uh Housekeepers Podcast, give you the last word, Mr. Thompson. One of the things that I uh, uh, took during the last 10 years was there it's a large challenge to use words in the right place, the right time, the right way. Explaining what you do, how you do it, and bringing value to what you do. And um, I had the opportunity to try out for a TED talk at one time. And it brought to me an awareness that I needed to focus on one thing. Um, a wow statement is a statement that gets somebody to go wow. So it took me a long time to create one. But folks, I have no problem with the industry we're in. I love the industry in. I am a janitor. And I save lives. I'm Dave Thompson.
I like that very much. The Housekeepers Podcast, thank you so much, Dave, for coming on the show and telling us your story. It's really great. You know what's funny, kind of ironic, is I'm actually reading a book called Exactly What to Say by Phil Jones. I'm actually doing a little book review on this book because I love it so much. It's so funny. All we keep talking about is the words you use, and I'm literally reading a book on the words you use. It's, it's kidding. I don't know what it is. If you like today's program, and I am sure you did, please make sure – that you reach out and you share the show and you tell everybody about the show and that you write a review and subscribe to it and make sure you're reaching out to Dave Thompson. Dave, what is your website? I know that there's beyond clean with eight, which is your podcast. Correct. You also have the Academy of cleaning excellence. Is it so it's Academy. Of excellence? It's Academy of cleaning.com. Perfect. Academy of cleaning.com. All of the links to get a hold of Dave and attend his classes or to listen to his podcast will be in the show notes. So make sure you reach out to Dave and let him know that you will listen to this podcast and that you enjoyed it. Otherwise, thank you, Dave. I'm Ralph. 